Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Aaron Lutz and I'm the campus pastor at our East 96 campus. You know, Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad you have joined us online to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe life is better when we do it together. When we, when we gather as a church, we say often that it's this non-downloadable experience. I mean, singing together and praying together and, and serving each other. Those are things that just don't translate online, but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so I'd encourage you and make plans to check out the campus nearest to you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us online at clearcreek.org to find more information about our locations, our service times, and a whole lot more. We hope to see you soon. All right, so we're one week away from Christmas Eve. How are you doing on Christmas shopping? Anybody have something else they need to get for somebody? Loved one? Yeah, a few people here and there. All right, so it's just a, maybe a, a public service announcement. I'll give you some ideas. So take a look at the screen here. Here are some things that have been popular. Uh, this... This plaid shacket, I see this on a lot of ladies. So if you have a lady in your life who needs a shacket, here you go. Um, and Uggs, this pink stuff apparently is all the rage. It's this like cleaning goo. You can use it in your sink and whatnot. Uh, air fryer has been popular for a couple of years. Carhartt jackets. I mean, if you don't have a Carhartt jacket, then I don't know what you're doing. Uh, Stanley cups. And, and then if, you know, if someone just wants a Starbucks drink and you're looking for something, you can get this caramel cloud thing. It resembles something that has very little bit of coffee in it. Um, <laughs> these things might look familiar to you because these are all things that have gone viral at some point in the last year or two on TikTok, Instagram, something like that. And all follows a very similar pattern. Somebody gets on social media and they post about how one of these things has changed their life Somebody then sees that, they go and try it, it changes their life, and so they go and share with other people, and it just grows exponentially. It's this organic, viral thing that happens. Now, from a marketer standpoint, this, I mean, this is just printing money. I mean, like, they love it when this stuff happens because if, if they can have a product get to where it's just going viral and people are selling out all over and the stocks or the shelves are getting uh, emptied out, they can't even keep it in stock. I mean, that's, that's just printing money for them. And so they really want this to continue to happen, but it always peters out at some point. At some point, it's no longer cool. And it's usually about the point when you start seeing it show up on, on morning talk shows uh, because that's when your mom now knows about it. <laughs> Another clue is when it shows up in a sermon illustration, right? Because I can tell you, if your mom knows about it and I know about it, it's no longer bussing, right? <laughs> We're staying bussing now, so we ruined that for you too. Because listen, brands and marketers, they, they know the power of word of mouth. According to Nielsen Media, media 20 or 92% of consumers say that they believe the recommendations of friends and family over all forms of other kinds of advertising. People want to hear from people that they know and that they trust. And marketers are, have caught on to that. And so the way they try to make things go viral is they want to try to pay influencers because people know that they're going to trust social media influencers. Or they're going to give incentives for giving five-star reviews because they know that people trust five-star reviews. But despite all the efforts to make something go viral, many times things don't go viral. Most of the time they don't go viral. And it's because we have this maybe an instinct of what's real and what's not real. Like, we don't want to hear from somebody that is paid to like something. We want to hear from someone who, who loves something so much that they can't keep it to themselves. They can't help but share it with the whole world around them because that thing is worth sharing. Now, if that's true for some consumer product like a shacket or an air fryer, then how much more is it true for the hope of Jesus? Now, we've been in this series called A People of Hope. Today's week three. And we've been talking about what does it look like to be a people of hope in a world that seems pretty hopeless lately? And so if you're just checking us out here, let me catch you up on where we've been for the last couple weeks, because today's message really builds off of where we've been for the last two weeks. And so last, or the first week, we talked about the nature of hope, that hope is, is a living hope. 
And it's found by having a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And so when we have this relationship with God, we have a living hope in us. Then last week, we talked about abounding in hope. That when things come at us in our life and things maybe aren't working out the way that we want it to, that through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, God gives us joy and peace. And that creates this abounding, overflowing hope in us, living hope, abounding hope. And today in our passage, we get a picture of what it looks like when this living and abounding hope of Jesus takes such a hold in your life that you can't keep it to yourself. And hope goes viral. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 13 through 17 today. But let me give you a little bit of context as we jump into it. Uh, Peter is writing to persecuted Christians. These are people who are following Jesus and they're being persecuted. They're suffering for their faith. And so every day they are experiencing maybe being belittled or being mocked or even threatened physically for their faith. At this point, Christianity was just a a minority religion, but it had been growing exponentially, started expanding all throughout the area and throughout the the world. It had become a movement, a movement that was seen by many as a nuisance to some and maybe even a threat to others. And so he's speaking in a word of encouragement to these people who have been discouraged by what they've been experiencing on a day-to-day basis. So let's go ahead and read it. This is verses 13, the first part of 14. And remember, this is supposed to be encouraging. This is what Peter says. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, because he knows they are suffering. Even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So we ask this rhetorical question. He's saying, if you are trying to be zealous for what is good, you're trying to do the right thing, live a godly life, who is there to harm you? Now picture yourself as this first century Christian. You're being persecuted. You're gathering together in a small group of people for a Sunday worship service. And as part of that worship service, someone reads this letter from the apostle Peter. And he says, who is there to harm you? if you will suffer for righteousness' sake. And you're thinking back over your week about how in the marketplace, in your community, in your family, you've been cast out, you've been mocked, you've been threatened. And now the question is, who is there to harm you? And you're thinking, well, there's a lot of people here to harm me. But Peter's not naive. He's not disconnected from the real suffering that's going on in the lives of these first century Christians. He's not saying, hey, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. You're not going to be harmed in any way at all. You kind of have this Jesus force field around you. But he's actually trying to give them a bigger perspective of what's going on, an eternal perspective. He's saying in the big scheme of things that there is no one who can harm you eternally. There's no one who can snatch you out of God's hand, that you have a hope, a secured future in Christ. And that hope can't be taken away from you. And it's because of that hope that then he can say this, as he goes on in verse 14 to the rest of our passage today. He says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So here's Paul's encouragement to these persecuted Christians. Have no fear of these people who are mocking you and belittling you and and threatening you, as they slander and revile you. Instead, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Let your reverence for Jesus and the living and abounding hope that you have in him be the thing that crowds out the fear of man in your heart. In other words, what Peter is saying to these Christians is to keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing all the good. Keep walking with Jesus and living the godly life. Let your way of life and your words point people to Jesus. 
So point, to people, to point people to Jesus in both your ways and your words. Now, as we think about ourselves and how we relate to this passage, we, we, we're not even in the same category as people in the first century when it comes to persecution or people being against our faith. But we can learn, learn a lot from them as we think about what does it look like to be people of hope in both our ways and our words. Like, this challenges us to live in a very countercultural way of life. Again, Christianity today is, isn't suffering the same kind of persecution as these first century Christians in Peter's day. Uh, very few of us are physically threatened or harmed or imprisoned for our faith. But maybe there are times when because you are a follower of Jesus, you're mocked or belittled or left out in some way. Maybe you have a coworker or a family member or a neighbor that just makes comments every once in a while, right, about how you're always going to church and how always this is a Christian. And, you know, she just believes in these fairy tales. And so how do you respond to those comments? Well, look back at what Peter said in verse 16 and 17. Notice how many times he says the word good. He says to have this good conscience, to continue you in your good behavior in Christ they're, because they're suffering for doing good. All these different examples of doing good, right, godly things. You want to know how to be a person of hope. You want to see hope go viral in the lives of people around you and in this world. It begins by living in a way of life that even the most skeptical and cynical and hardened by church people that you know in your life that they can't help but think, I don't believe what they believe, but there's something different about them. And I can't put my finger on it. When you meet ridicule with love and mocking with serving, when you let your, your good behavior, your good conscience, as Peter says, show, it's, it speaks volumes to people. It speaks volumes. I think about a guy that I know of who he works in an industry where it's just common that you underreport your income so that way you don't have to pay as much in taxes, right? That's what everybody does. Like, it's not a big deal. You just kind of do this. Everybody does it except for this guy. He decided very early on in his career that he was going to keep his integrity and he was going to report his income honestly. And this sounded crazy confusing to the people that he worked with. Why would you just give away your money like that? I mean, it's not a big deal. Everybody does this. But he made this decision. He was committed to following Jesus in every, every, of his, every, every area of his life, even in this one, that those people may have thought it was just a minor thing, but for him it was a big deal, and he wanted to keep his integrity. Or I think of the guy who... His relationship with his neighbor always felt a little bit strained. Like this guy was always like grumpy towards him, not very friendly. As, as much as he tried to be friendly to him, this guy just didn't seem to like him. And so at some point just wrote that relationship off. I guess we're just never really going to be friends. But at some point, he learned that that guy was diagnosed with cancer. And so as he was going through treatment, he started to mow his lawn every week. And as he did that, there was a, a difference in that relationship. His heart was was softened. He was much more open. In both instances, the way they lived their lives spoke volumes. And this has been true throughout church history. There's been many moments when followers of Jesus have shocked people by the way they live their life. It spoke volumes. People took notice. The very last Roman emperor, uh, Julian, uh, in the fourth century, he had this, this big push to bring back paganism, right? So he was trying to bring it on back and he was getting everyone excited about it. He was trying to make paganism go viral. And so he was rebuilding temples to Roman gods and trying to make it a big deal. The problem was Christianity was going viral and it was the thing that people wanted to hear about. It was spreading rapidly and it was overshadowing all of his efforts to bring back paganism. And so out of frustration, he wrote this letter to a friend of his who was a pagan priest. He said this, he said, atheism, that's what he called Christianity because they didn't believe in the Roman gods, which is ironic. But Christianity has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. 
It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar. And that the godless Galileans, that's what he called Christians, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. Think about the impact it makes when followers of Jesus are known for how they outserve and outlove the rest of the world. Think about how countercultural it is to really live as people of hope. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to do this perfectly. But let me just kind of dispel that a little bit. Like if you live a authentic life where you are really yourself, yeah, there's going to be times when, when you mess that up. There's going to be times where you let your anger get the best of you, where you do things or you say things that you wish you hadn't. There will be times where you have to ask for forgiveness for something that you've said or done to somebody else. But God can still use you. Because at the end of the day, you are not pointing to your good behavior. You're pointing to your good Savior and the hope that you found in the grace and the forgiveness and the love of Jesus. The way you live your life speaks volumes. And at the very least, that should provoke questions in the people around you. Questions in the people around you. That's why Peter doesn't just encourage us to let people see the hope that you have in Jesus in your way of life. He also encourages, encourages you to do that in your words as well, your ways and your words. Look back at verse 15 with me. He says that we must always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. When you're living a countercultural way of life, it will naturally provoke questions from people who are around you. They will ask you a reason for the hope that is in you. They'll wonder, what makes her different? What makes him different? And that question often comes after a long period of time of seeing how you live your life, seeing how you respond to struggles and things that you go through. And maybe for a long time, it doesn't provoke any questions. But then one moment, they go through one of those life-rattling experiences that we all have. One of those things that causes you to, to question what you've built your life upon, that reveal that maybe you've been building your life upon a shaky foundation because you just got the le the, your legs cut out from underneath you. And what do you do? Well, they start looking for, for answers. They look to people in their life that they know of that seem to be standing on a firm foundation. Not someone who doesn't have any struggles and problems, but people who seem to weather those struggles and problems with a, a living and abounding, abounding hope. And so they ask you the reason for the hope that is in you. Why do you have hope when the world seems so hopeless? So that means... You must be prepared, prepared to give an answer or a reason why you have this hope. Peter says to be ready to make a defense, a defense. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to know all the answers to the Bible or theology questions or even be able to defend the faith against somebody who maybe has some of the hardest, most skeptical questions for you. Those are helpful things to learn about. Right? And, and grow in so that way you can engage in some of those tougher questions. But that's not primarily what Peter has in mind here, actually. If you read through the book of Acts, Acts tells the, the story of the very early church when it grew from the small group of disciples to just exploding onto the world stage as it just grew and went viral. You see these different episodes where someone is making a defense for the faith. Peter gets arrested in Acts 4. He has to make a defense before the high priest. We see Paul get arrested in Acts 22. He makes a defense before the Roman tribune and then against the, uh, before the, the governor Felix and then King Agrippa. And it's interesting to, to notice what they say when they make their defense. They simply just tell their story. They tell their story 
of what happened to them when they met Jesus and the difference that the hope of the gospel has now made in their life. That's what it means to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, to boldly share your story of the difference that Jesus has made in your life and why you now believe in the good news of the gospel, to share your story boldly. Now, check this out. Because when we think about boldness, the, what, what Peter is talking about is not really the way that we think about boldly making your defense. Here's what he said in verse, 13, uh, in verse 15. He says, this is how we should make our defense, with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. I love that. It seems like it was written for our day. Because we seem to only know how to express ourselves with contempt and a sense of superiority. Not gentleness and respect. And so we struggle with this as a society. And the unfortunate truth is behaving with gentleness and respect is a lost skill in our day, which makes it all the more refreshing when someone works up the courage to ask you why you believe what you believe. And without getting preachy or judging or, you know, condemning in any way, with gentleness and respect, you share the reason why you have hope. You genuinely care about them, and you engage in their life and their struggles. You see, people want to hear from someone who loves something so much that they can't keep it to themselves, that they can't help but share it with the world around them because that thing is worth sharing. I tell you, if you want to see the hope of the gospel go viral, it happens when when you let your ways provoke questions, your words are prepared to answer. Let your ways provoke questions, your words are prepared to answer. This is a call to live in such a way that is so countercultural, so honest and authentic, so loving, so serving, that it provokes questions about where your hope actually comes from. And when those questions come your way, you are prepared to give a gentle and respectful answer about what happened to you when you met Jesus and the hope that has made a difference in your life as you have sought to follow him. Your ways and your words tell people where your hope is. So let your ways provoke questions your words are prepared to answer. Now, what does that look like? I want to give you just a really practical way to think through this, maybe in some different categories. If you've been around here for a little while, uh, you've heard us use the BLESS acronym before. Uh, it's a way that we talk about how we engage people that we know of who are not followers of Jesus, not as projects, but as people that we love and that we hope that they would know the, the hope of the gospel. And so if you haven't heard this before, maybe you even just write it down uh, because it is helpful to think through. But it looks like this. We first begin in prayer. We believe that someone coming to faith in Jesus is an act of God and not our act. If someone moves from being skeptical or curious about faith to being a follower of Jesus, God has to do something in them that we can't do. And so we pray. We pray that God would do that work in their life. We ask them how we can pray for them. Maybe there's things going on in their life that we can just pray for but we ask that God would soften their heart, that he would save them, that he would give us opportunity to be able to share the difference that the hope of Jesus has made in our life. And we also listen. That's part of being in a relationship with someone. We, we hear their story, their perspective, hear their questions and their doubts and their fears, their hangups about faith, maybe even church. We listen because good friends listen. David Augsburger said, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Being heard is one of the ways that we love people. And so we listen. But we also do a really easy one, which is to eat. Right? We gather around with people. We share good food and good drink and make good memories around the table. I tell you, this is one of the favorite things of Jesus. 
He was often sitting around the table and eating with people who were very different from him, people from all walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of baggage that they brought with them. Because when you eat with someone, when you invite them into your home, when you have coffee or have lunch with them, you are communicating that you value that relationship, that you value that person. And it opens up the conversation. Good friends eat together. But we also serve people. This is the stuff we talked about earlier. It's where your faith, the, the rubber meets the road, where the way that you live out your faith makes this impact on people around you. People can see that it's not all talk, but there's actually actions that can be seen, that can be even felt by them. And it can be very simple things, like mowing your neighbor's lawn, their side of that line. You know, there's that line between your yard and their yard, and it always kind of feels like, who's going to mow that line? Mow their side of the line. Or when you see there's a big rainstorm and you see their trash can floating down the street, that you go and you just pull it up and go put it next to their garage just as a way to, to serve them. Or bring somebody cookies, right? There, there's all different ways that we can serve someone. Think about your workplace. Maybe someone's under the gun and they're trying to get a project done and you give up some of your time to help them. Or they need to take some time away for a family emergency and, and you agree to, to take their shift. Or maybe it just looks like being involved in the community. Using your time to volunteer, care about the things that the community cares about. Because serving speaks volumes about where your hope is. And finally, we tell our story. We tell our story. People today are looking for hope. And when they see it in you, they want to know more about it. It provokes questions in them. And many times, if you know them well enough, they might even ask you, the reason for the hope that's in you. And it's an opportunity to make a defense, to, to share your story of the difference that the hope of the gospel has made in you. There's this encounter that Jesus has in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus and his disciples, they got into a boat, they sailed across the Sea of Galilee, and they land in this area that was a, it was a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area. And as soon as they land, they're met with this demon-possessed guy, it says that he was living among the tombs, living among this graveyard, right? Creeped by everybody in town out. And so they had tried to chain him up, but he had this like crazy, you know, demonic superpower strength and he would break the chains. And so he's living in the tombs. He's a social outcast. You think about just the epitome of, of hopelessness, right? Demon possessed, social outcast. And I won't tell you the whole thing, but Jesus heals him, right? You can read it on your own. Jesus heals this guy, casts out the demons, and then he gets in a boat to go back with his disciples. And when he does, it says that this formerly demon-possessed guy begs Jesus that he might go with him. And Jesus does something surprising. Up to this point, as he was going around preaching throughout the whole area, he kept calling people to follow me, follow me, follow me. And this guy wants to follow him. He wants to get in the boat and go be a part of this Jesus movement. But Jesus tells him something surprising. Here's what he says. He says, it did not permit him to follow him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so what does he do? He went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, which is the whole area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Now, your story probably doesn't involve being demon-possessed, but you have a story, a story of being lost and then found, a story of being dead in your sin to being brought back to life and experiencing this abundant life. And so the call of Jesus is very simple. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Learn to tell your story. What life was like before you met Jesus, what it's been like since you met Jesus, and how the, the hope of the gospel has made a difference in your life. Let your ways provoke questions your words are prepared to answer. So, you want to see hope go viral. If hope goes viral, when people of hope 
do this, what does it mean for you? What does it look like in your life? I mean, the question you have to ask yourself is, do my ways and my words do that? Do my ways and my words point people to Jesus? Do the people in your life even see a difference in you? And maybe for you, you'd say, yeah, I mean, I'm not perfect all the time, but I'm trying to live out my faith. I'm trying to look for ways that I can bless people around me and share my story. And if that's you, then Peter's encouragement to you is saying, way to go. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep living out the hope of the gospel of Jesus in your ways and your words. But for many of you, maybe you're thinking, man, I don't think this is true of me. I'm not really sure people see a difference in me. I don't know if I... My way of life provokes questions, or at least the right kind of questions. And if the right kind of questions come my way, I'm not sure I'm even prepared to answer them. Maybe you would even go as far as saying, I kind of hope people around me don't know that I'm a Christian or that I go to church because I'm not sure I've really represented my faith very well. I kind of think if somebody found out that I was a Christian, they would say, you? You're a Christian? I would have never guessed. And if that's you, you should know that there is grace here, but there's also a call. There is a call to to realign your life, to turn towards Jesus and and to align your life to following him once again. We we call this repentance. Repentance means to turn away from something and to turn towards following Jesus once again. And it is a regular rhythm if you are a follower of Jesus. Every person here, if you are a Christian, you will be repenting every day for the rest of your life. You'll be turning away from something and realigning your life to Christ. And so you have to ask yourself, what do you need to repent of today? What area of your life are you not really following Jesus? You've kind of kept it to the side. Maybe it is an issue around money and integrity and around your workplace. Maybe it's in your your sexual ethic or your gossip and how you talk about other people when they're not there or your anger and how you treat other people. The call is to repent of those things and to realign your life with Christ and he welcomes you with grace as we continue to repent. But maybe for some of you today, as we talk about hope, we talk about the the, the love and the grace and the peace that is found by faith in Jesus, you realize that you don't have that hope and you want it. Like you don't have that story of being lost and then found dead and now alive, but you want it. You want that to be your story. You want to trust in Jesus and begin to follow him from here on out. The good news is, is today's the day that you can begin to follow Jesus and know that you have this secured hope in Christ through faith. So here's what I want us to do. I want to invite you just, all of us just to bow with me. And if that is you, if today is the day that you want to say yes to Jesus and begin following him, to repent of an old way of life and to now follow him with your ways and your words, you can just pray this simple prayer in your own words to God that goes something like this. Father, I realize that I have run a thousand other directions away from you. And now I'm turning to you and I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm submitting to him as my Lord and my Savior. Would you save me? Would you wash me clean of my sin, my past, my present, and my future? I believe. Would you save me? And if you pray that to God, you should know that in that moment that you became a child of God that your hope is now in a resurrected king. It's not based on your good behavior, but on his. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus. We thank you that we can have a living and abounding hope. We thank you that we can be a part of your viral movement around the world and to see that happening in places like Africa and South America and Asia and the Middle East and Europe and even in in our own community, would you let us be a part of that? 
Would you challenge us to live in a way that provokes questions, a countercultural way that follows what you call us to do, that we would submit our lives to you? Would you give us opportunities as people ask why we live so differently, why we love and serve so differently? Would you give us the words to be able to share the hope that we found in you, to be able to share our story of what happened to us when we met you and the difference that the hope of the gospel has made? So, Father, we give you our lives. We give you our ways and our words. We ask that you would be glorified in us and through us, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up in every part of our life. We pray this in his name. Amen.